Good evening, everyone. Um, this is the test run for doing live interviews for the Cook County Historical Society membership week or month that we are having in September. Um, I am hanging out with the Anderson family, which is uh, sort of one of the things when I joined the board at the Historical Society that I wanted to do was to make it feel like you were sitting down at someone's kitchen table who was a uh, you know, a longtime resident of Cook County or grew up here um, and just listen to them tell stories. And and how do you bring that feeling into a museum? You can't really, that's hard to do without having these people sit there all day at the museum waiting for people to come in. So um, I have gotten to know the Anderson family who has been, uh, they were my neighbors when I was growing up. Um, and then I have worked with uh, well, Wayne and Phyllis Anderson, I worked with their son, Kent, uh, logging for uh, just one winter, but it was my favorite job ever. Um, and uh, got to know Wayne and Phyllis really well during that time and loved hearing, sitting, having coffee in the mornings and uh, hearing stories. And um, it helps that they're very talented storytellers not to put any pressure on them this evening or anything. Um, and uh, so we're gonna we're gonna try this out, see how it goes. Um, tonight is just mostly for technical stuff to figure out. The Andersons are still eating dinner at the moment <laughs> because when you have a, a, a farm, you you have lots to do during the daylight hours and you know, Baling hay was one. And baling hay needs to be done before the rain comes tonight. Uh, so let's see here. Wayne seems to be done eating sort of at the moment. And so I'll just ignore everybody else's chewing. It's fine. It'll all be good. Um, I'm going to try something here. Let's see if that connects. If anyone is watching, if you can try and send me a message in the chat function, I would appreciate that so I can see if that works. Um, but here it's introducing the Andersons for the first time tonight. This is Rolf, right behind the milk jug. Wayne over there and Phyllis, and Kent. Everyone with their mouths open. <laughs> so I wanted to start off with um, talking about, now, Wayne, did your parents move here? Or were they born here? Or? My mother was born here. My dad moved here. My dad was born in Sweden. And... Uh, he came over to this country when he was about three and a half years old, I guess. <clears throat> I think my grandpa was an iron miner in Sweden, so they he, they went up to the iron range. He, they lived in Tower Sedan, and he worked as a miner. And so they um, lived there for about 10 years. They, I think they came in about uh, 18... Around just before 1890, maybe. And anyhow, um, my grandpa uh, was uh, arthritic, they call it rheumatism in those days. And the doctor said that he really should get out of the coal, it was an underground mine, of course, get really get out of the coal damp mine because you'll never uh, be comfortable or anything as long as you're underground. So he had a friend up here, so and he didn't know where else to go. So this is where he came, and, uh, as a boy at ten. And then, of course, my mother was born here, and my grandpa, on her side, came. I think in maybe uh, around that time. I can't exactly remember the year, but around that time, and he. He came here, I think, when he was about 18. 
and uh, worked as a carpenter and such. So uh, I have three generations in the Maple Hill Cemetery. So I guess I qualify as being a native. I was born here, of course, and uh, my 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 father, my gra grandfather, and his mother, my grandfather's mother, all are in the Maple Hill Cemetery. So uh, we go back a ways. I would say so. And what did your uh, parents do? <clears throat> well, they like <clears throat> like everyone else that came up here in their around the turn of the century, they they did whatever you have to do to survive. And, uh, you know, some of it was, although my, my dad was never a, a farmer, uh, uh, they had farm, uh, when he was a boy and uh, with living at home, they had animals, but he never did. And so he either worked in the wood, or started out trapping, and then he worked in the woods as a logger, logger a teamster. Then he, Worked with my my mother's father, my other grandpa, and they put together the <clears throat> first Edstrom sawmill out of burnt burnt out junk that they bought from Ed Toffee at oh, the Toffee the mill had burnt, and they hauled it home in the winter time with with I think four horses and and then. Build it up, and, and that's what started the, the extra lumber company. And, uh, and then later on, my dad worked at, uh, worked for the state forest service, and uh, first as like a tower man. Well, he worked actually for the federal too, uh, as a tower man, and then later as just a you know a forester and a forest technician and stuff until his retirement. My mother was never, uh, she was a homemaker and never, well, she worked, she helped when my grandpa started the sawmill because they had big crews of men and she had to cook and, and feed all those people. So, but after her, you know, after she was married, she became just a homemaker. Not just, she became a homemaker. I, I'll, I'll take that back if I may. <laughs> <laughs> I'll get hit by, by <laughs> <laughs> mm -hmm. So um, you grew up here on Maple Hill. Yes. And uh, now the house that you're in now, did your parents have that or no. the land or how'd that all work? Where my son Kent lives, that was my, that was the home place. That's where my dad lived and I, I lived as a youngster. Uh, this place where we live now was built by my dad's brother, um, my uncle Joe, uh, sometime maybe in the 20s. And then uh, he, he, he sold it in probably in the sometime in the 40s. And then it changed hands uh, the Ridgeways lived here, and the former superintendent, uh, Albert Engberg, lived here. And then uh, when he left, he still owned the place for quite a while, but uh, it was rented. And then in 19-something... 67. 67, we bought it uh, as a temporary place to live until I could build something. And we kind of... It was so bad that we had to start... We were modeling before we could even live in it. And then we kind of took root here, so we never got never got away from here. And Maple Hill was its own community. Very you know? much so. And <clears throat> very much a uh, very close knit community and the people the people who the descendants of the survivors uh, the survivors of the people that lived here when I was young. <clears throat> are still very close. Uh, you know, when uh, there, there was a great uh, camaraderie and, and uh, affection for the, for the neighbors. Now, 
we have neighbors and, you know, some of them maybe lived here for 15, 20 years. I've never even met them. People live on Maple. You know, it's a different era. But at that time, everybody knew one another and everybody pulled together. And, and uh, if you were... If you walked on the road, you, you'd get picked up by somebody who would give you a lift. They, they, you wouldn't just ankle along by yourself. Uh, there was no such a thing as a danger of picking up hitchhikers or anything like that. It was just common, common sense. In fact, if you didn't have a ride to town or something and you wanted to go to town, and in the wintertime, of course, the, the roads were, they were plowed, but but they were never sanded or uh, or anything, and and so they'd get very uh, compacted snow and slick. So if you had to go to town, if you were somebody who didn't have a car or somebody's wife that wanted to go down and buy groceries or something, you jump on a, a runner sled, a steel runner coaster sled, and you could be in town in five minutes from here, and we're you know about three miles, and uh, and then you'd. You'd probably you'd know somebody that you'd you know go and say somebody who worked at a store or somewhere. Can I get a lift up the hill when you're ready to go? And you okay? And they'd park your sled there and you do whatever shopping you want to do. And when they came home, they dropped you off. It was a neat time. That sounds wonderful. I remember uh, Olga Erickson had a scrapbook that she made. Yes. And in the scrapbook was all of the Erickson. Yep. A lot of it was Erickson stuff. And yep. on there was uh, Warren, Mr. Erickson and his son Warren went to town today. That yeah. made the paper. Oh, it was a big deal. <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah, it was a big deal. It took them all day probably. You know. Uh-huh. Yeah, so. Yeah. And there were two... Weren't there two schools on Maple Hill? Yes, there were. There was the east side and the west side. The, the west side was over by the, well, uh, where uh, uh, Paul, Peter, uh, Paul, Paul Peterson. Peter Peterson lives now in that area, the, the west side school. And then the east side school was over where Howard Hudson lives now. And so... Uh, because everybody either had to walk to school or they had to take a horse or a pony or something. So there were no school buses that then. There were school buses in my time, but and at that time, that's why there were. And then I think, I think in about maybe 1918 or 20, they built the Maple Hill Central School where Chief Steve Carlson lives now. Mm -hmm. And that, and that, uh, where I went to school, and uh, so, uh, and but in that time, the, well, when my sister, who is six years older than I am, and my brother, when they started in the winter time, they went to school with horses, uh, school rig they call them. It was a sleigh with a with a cab thing on it, and and they had little charcoal foot warmers, and you got on the they ride in the sleigh and the horses took you to, to the school and then picked you up and brought you home in the wintertime. And then at some time they had what they call, uh, oh, I guess it's still a school race. And they looked like they looked like a covered wagon. There was a wagon with a canvas top. And uh, I suppose mainly because I suppose the roads were some muddy in the spring and that they probably couldn't, even if they had a motor vehicle, you couldn't get through. So horses would always get them to school. So, uh, and when I went to school in Maple Hill, the, behind the school was a big, well, you'd call it a garage now, but we called it a wagon shed, and it had all these old wagons in it and the sleighs and the stuff that they had used. And we used to play in there, of course, and, and we finally took the wagons out and took the boxes off and rolled them down the hill and somebody would steer until <clears throat> the teachers put a stop there. <laughs> 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 one, one uh, <clears throat> the teachers told this guy that was, well, was one of the boosters uh, from Clearwater that was going to school. And see, they, there was a hill behind the school, so they'd push the wagon up there, then they'd get on and somebody'd steer with their feet, and they'd come rolling down the hill past the school, down 
And anyhow, <clears throat> they said, you can't do that. It's too dangerous. You might hit the flagpole. And it was a steel flagpole they had there. And Roscoe Wooster said, well, it wouldn't hurt the flagpole much. <laughs> <laughs> so that, that was the that was the attitude in those days. Um, big deal. <laughs> but so did the Gunflint Trail kids go to school at Maple Hill too? Then you know, they had, they did. They, they there was of course there was no bus service to the well anywhere even to Devil's Track there wasn't bus service. So everybody that lived <clears throat> uh, back either on the Devil Track Road and and or the Gunflint Trail they had to. They had to either, the people either had to move down in the winter or they had to board out their kids. And some of the neighbors would take in boarders. So, so you know, like the Boostrom kids, they lived with my uh, uncle, my dad's brother, Uncle Victor, and Hilda. They lived there. <clears throat> and some, like the Brandt kids and those from Poplar, they lived down there with my uncle Emil down here. and. And uh, of course, they'd, everybody would go home on weekends, but during the week, the kids would have to stay with someone. Of course, they were well cared for, and, and it wasn't a hardship. Uh, but even from Devil's Track, like the Thompson brothers and the, and the Riley, Bill Riley, and those, they had to board board out. They boarded at Lenskoog's, uh, you know. We're, we're on the bus route. They're, they're, otherwise, you couldn't go to school. Hmm. Yeah. How many people were in your class when you graduated? In my class, my graduating class in Grand Rapids, I think it was 25. And when I started school in first grade, there were two. Two? Two. <laughs> Lloyd Evers and myself. And then, and then uh, mid-year, uh, the the Bent family moved up to Double Track. So then well, we had three, Walter Bent and Roy and myself. Yeah, <clears throat> that, was the, that was the class size. And of course, <clears throat> the first four grades were in one room and, uh, and then the other upper four grades were in another room. And of course, when, you know, when you sit in the schoolroom with multiple, this is, of course, common knowledge to anybody who's gone to a one-room school, but by the time uh, you, everybody in, above the first grade could recite, you know, you'd heard the whole thing so many times that it, <laughs> even the kids could help somebody that couldn't figure out what the, you know, it, it, it was, it was People were close. It was it was a good time, and then all the kids, all the grades, played together. You know, and we'd at recess we'd have ball games or sliding or whatever. Everybody played together. <clears throat> First grade up to eight, and <clears throat> never a problem with, with uh, anybody being picked on or anything like that. Never. It's always just very very comfortable. No bullying. Pardon me? No bullying? Oh, I don't know. I, I shouldn't say no, but, you know, it, it wasn't very bad. It was pretty good. And, and if it was, if you did, uh, if somebody had an inclination to pick on somebody, they probably somebody had an older brother or something would straighten them right out. So <laughs> there was nothing to, nothing to worry about. I think even in... Our family we've had older brothers that oh, yeah. take it's, care of the younger it's, it's, ones. It's, it still works. <laughs> it still works. Yeah. yeah, that is a nice thing about <clears throat> intergeneration stuff. You. That's true. Yeah, it, it's uh, the older ones look out for the little ones, the younger ones, and and, and you learn from them. Some some of it's good, some of it's not so good, but you learn. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, and I was thinking, you know, like the. Uh, historical wise, like the, I was just mentioning, like the Rileys and the Thompsons and all that uh, came in from Devil's Track. And now, I suppose, I haven't heard lately, but it seems to me there's something like 200 houses or cabins on Devil's Track Lake 
or more than that, maybe 225. I don't know it for sure. But at that time, there was like three, three people, three families. There was an old bachelor, Harry Hayes, he lived on the east end of the lake. <clears throat> he was a brother to Ben Robertson, who was a, who had the fox farm where the Scar Skyport is now. He had a silver fox farm. And one of his buildings still exists. It's a tall building. And that's with the watchtower for the, watching the foxes so they didn't have any trouble. And uh, so anyhow, and then Bent's moved to that place. And then up the road, uh, Riley's had a place. Uh, William Riley's, and then the Thompsons were just beyond the, the double track, and then on the north side there was a oh, sort of a farmer, uh, Cedarstrom place it was called, and, uh, but he wasn't there in my time, but the, the place was there, and then of course it's, uh, that's where uh, uh, Stephen Sherry Watson live now. But and that's the only, and there was nobody on the south side when I was very young. There was that. There was an old, some old pensioner or something that he had, he started a place on the south side called the Old Sailor's Home. And he had a building or of some sort. And he had some old like spear skiffs and stuff there. The only way to access that was either up the Meridian Road or he had to cross the lake from the other side. There was no, there was no access to the south shore at all. But, uh, and of course, uh, Prior to that, on the and this is before my time also, but on the east end of the lake there was a sawmill. Charlie Johnson had a sawmill, and uh, we used to swim there. And you talk about a, a sand beach. It wasn't a sand beach; it was a sawdust beach. It, the lake was full of sawdust, <laughs> but it was nice and soft walking. But it was it was sawdust. And then where the skyport is now, there was also a mill there earlier. Again, before my time, but but that's that's all there was up in that area. And and when my dad first came to to uh, Cook County, and he went, they'd he'd, they'd heard he and his uncle heard, had heard that it's supposed to be good fishing in Devil's Strike Lake. So they they walked up there, and they, somebody had an old boat there, and they uh, my uncle was rowing, my dad was fishing, I suppose, with a hand line. And they didn't get anything right away. And, and my uncle said, "I, my, my dad's uncle, my great uncle said, I don't know if this lake is as good as they say it is. And just about that time, they got a monster snorther. But <laughs> they could hardly get in the boat. You know, it was just a huge. And they got, after that, they got more than they wanted, a huge northerns. It was, it was very good fishing there. And then, you know, huge northerns, 25, 20, 25 pounds. So that's where things change. It is amazing how there are places that, you know, you think of sawmills. Like if, if you were to remove headstrums, yeah. I think we think it's going to still look like that forever. But yeah. if you, and you, if you abandon trace. it, yeah. it'll yeah. just be In gone. In a few years, you won't see a tree. You know, uh, so many of these places. There was a sawmill right down, right down here by... Uh, well, below where the Johnsons lived down here, just because, and in those days the sawmills were someplace where there was water because they had to run them with steam. There was a little fresh or stream that went through there, so that's where the sawmill was. And then there was one just past Kent's house, uh, down by the little double track, the south, and that the remains of that were there when I was young. We used to, it had, of course, all sawmills. Eventually burned, and that, and that one did do it. Steam mills, especially because they got the fire. Foolishness. Yeah. When, things, <laughs> when foolish. things dry out and they have a steam engine <laughs> boiler going, on, they burn. For any uh, any history you read about sawmills, I ran from so and so and so and so and so until it burned. And then, yeah, steam mill. So. I just have to interject. It's not exactly historical society, you know, necessarily material, but just to put Kent on the, the hot seat for a minute. So um, one of the speaking of sawmills burning, you <laughs> when how old were you when 
there was a fire at Headstrom's. The uh, the one where you wrote the letter. 42. Um or the news article. Seven. Seven. <laughs> Probably. And and what did you do with this information then? Well, I had an imagination. A big one. So generally so I so I had my own sawmill. So generally whatever happened over at that sawmill happened over at mine as well most of the time. Mm-hmm. So okay. you didn't light your sm- sawmill on fire? Not literally. Oh. However, I did destroy it. Ah. <laughs> yeah. I had to give it the effect of being destroyed. And then you decided to start a newspaper? Well, I, no, but it needed to be reported. It was newsworthy. So, yeah. Oh. So I didn't have a weekly newspaper after that, but I did have a newspaper for that particular incident. And when he was really little, he would write books about sawmill and different things and and when he since he couldn't write at four years of age very well his mother had to write the book he would dictate and i would write the book for him oh my <laughs> and all these are archived still we have them oh, yeah, still. Mm-hmm. so they will be in the historical society at some <laughs> point so only when it becomes good history right now they're <laughs> when i'm gone then they can do it <laughs> But as I recall, there was a fire. You wrote that there was a fire at the mill. Kent Anderson's mill. At at Kent Anderson. Okay, you just say it instead of my repeating it to you and you nodding. Well, and the cause, it was caused by foolishness. (laughs) They quoted quoted Kent Anderson in the paper. That's what it was. Kent Anderson said the cause, it was caused by foolishness. Oh my goodness. Which was likely, which was likely language that he'd heard. Well, from, obviously, yeah, it was from parents and grandparents right. Right, and other peers. Yeah. Okay, so I've made it, but that quote was woven into the book. <laughs> and we we say it. Uh, it's a it's a trailer to many and, expressions yeah, around here. Right. This yeah. week we we use it several well, times. Yeah, it's called the fool's correct context. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, there is kind of a whole language that is, you know, within close knit families that happens. Uh, I yeah. have found, and it's expanded just beyond the family. You know, <laughs> neighbor kids and others all, yeah. uh, they all know this. Yes, yeah. yes, <laughs> it's not a private secret language. No, no, everybody, no. everybody, right? It's yeah, it's it. well known. It's kind of well, if you're a local on Maple Hill, you're generally lucky enough to. Yeah. Yes. Be subject to knowing it. Yes, this is true. Before we get off uh, the subject that we were on, where my dad was talking about um, fishing and and a few things about those early days, there's a if you could just elaborate a little bit more on your dad. He was pretty amazing pioneer in the sense of what he did at a very young age and you don't have to go into horrible detail although every story we could spend all night because they're extremely interesting but but if you could you know some of the things he did for himself even yeah he 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 built a he built a canvas covered canoe when he was 16 years old and he'd never seen one but he figured there's got to be something better than birch bark so he built himself a canvas canoe at 16, and he had to do it because he had to do it on the sly in, in a frog pond behind their house because his dad thought, you know, said, what's this foolishness if you are gonna got time for something like that? You, you, we'll find something useful for you to do. <laughs> so, so he had to do that. At 17, he and, and uh, one of, one of uh, Skinner's relatives, uh, Osborne Elfquist, uh, had a trap line together, and they trapped from Maple Hill to Northern Light to Tom Lake. And that was their that was their circuit, and they had a shack at Northern Light and a shack at Tom Lake. And they <clears throat> were out there in, in the fall, and they just didn't have. <clears throat> I've told this story before, and but I'll just briefly tell it again. And they and they. Didn't have it was a nice fall and they didn't have any uh, snowshoes with them, just uh, regular clothes and 
and food or whatever. And anyhow, they, they were out at Tom Lake and the, at bedtime, they went out and, ooh, it's really snowing. And anyhow, it did. It snowed all night and I guess the next day, I think they got either 30, 30 or 36 inches of snow, wet snow. And Early November. And they were up at Tom Lake with no snowshoes and no, no road or nothing, you know. Well, nowadays, there's got somebody, young, young people, older than that even, get stuck with a snowmobile or something. They're, they're just about, they just about perish and they're only two miles off the road someplace. But, you know, we got to send out search and rescue and airplanes and whatever. Anyhow, they, they, my dad made skis when the weather cleared in the morning or whenever, next day, he made skis, he split them out of a cedar log and used his boot tops for straps. And they, they knew they'd never get back to Maple Hill on their trapping trail because everything was down. Was just, but there was a... Tremendous was a, windfalls, or snow yeah. mm -hmm. down from the So uh, there was a tote road not too far from their shack that Pigeon River Company had when they were logging up in that area. So they headed for that. And again, the tote road was full of windfalls. You know, they'd have to go around windfalls, around windfalls, around windfalls. But when they got partway down, they met a, a crew of lumberjacks coming that were opening the road. So they had a little better going. So anyhow, they had started in the morning and they, they had to go to, to Hovland. Uh, from Tom Lake, and then they had to, uh, when they got there, it hadn't snowed as much on the shore, so they threw their skis in the Blue Tree River, and, and then they walked to Grand Murray from, from Homeland. This is all one day now. And then when they got to Grand Murray, of course, it was about midnight, there was no place to stay, so then they walked to Maple Hill. So they did it all in a day, Walk from Tom Lake to Hopeland. Back, well, back and there, there weren't the roads or anything no, that there no, are no. now well, either. It was, it was obviously some kind of trail or, you know, but not a, not a road road. No. Yeah. And I'm sure if you had to, I don't know if there was bridges or whatever, who knows, you know. They, you came to, I, there must have been some kind of bridge on the devil's side, I suppose. That's anyway, cool. that some of them, I suppose, you just had to afford, you know. And this was a, the two of them and, and the other party was uh, Osborne, Osborne Elk, Elk West. West. Yeah. And that would be Skinner's great, the great or great, great uncle. Hmm. And they were about how old at that time? 17. They were 17. Well, you know, so a lot of 17 year olds nowadays can hardly tie their shoes. Why? <laughs> but why? There's Velcro. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's it. Yeah. But they didn't have any Velcro for their, for their skis, so they had to make them out of boot tops. Anyhow, what that's about, one of the stories. What about the moose? Yeah, what? To, to, um, oh, yeah. The, uh, that's another thing <laughs> that, that he did. When, when they came up here, uh, settlers were mostly. And this yeah, is your dad. You, my dad. Yeah. My dad and his family, when they came here, and. <clears throat> Settlers were mostly Scandinavian, and uh, over there, the, they weren't hunters because the game belonged to the king, and so the, oh, Sweden. the ordinary people, you, you couldn't hunt or take wild game. So the, when they when those immigrants came here, they'd, they'd <clears throat> bargain with the Indians, and they traded potatoes or vegetables or something and for moose meat or because they most of them didn't have a gun or if they did they didn't know how to use it and so anyhow my, when my dad was 15 he couldn't figure out why you had to be an Indian to be able to shoot a moose he had a <laughs> shotgun <clears throat> so he so he hammered out a lead ball I don't know what he where he got got the material to make it out of, but he had some lead and he hammered, I suppose a net, net lead or something. He hammered out a lead ball that would roll through the bore of the shotgun. And then he went up on the Elbow River in a, a pond there 
where he knew the moose came out and he built a platform up in a tree and he sat up there in the evening and the bull moose came out and he shot it with a shotgun. Well, he had one shot, but he got it. And then of course, I think that, I think he was the first, one of the first, uh, I shouldn't say first white man, but one of the first of the, of the immigrant class at that time, obviously there'd been others, you know, French and whatnot before that, but of, of, the, of the local settlers, he was the first one that ever shot a moose. And after that, uh, Osborne, his hunting buddy or crapping, he shot one with a 25-20, which is not a very big gun, but he got it and so on. So, so that's what they did. He was 15. He was 15. It would have been about 1901. Yeah. Yeah. And then one more thing before we can move on, but just tell him a little about when he he got that property at uh, near El Balboa River, uh, and he was and how he was able to buy himself books and you know just the history. Of, yeah. Well, <clears throat> he didn't speak a lot of English, I suppose, before. Well, he you know, like I say, my. Uh, he had he had very little formal education. I don't think he went beyond the sixth grade, but he probably was pretty sparse then because you have to stay home and work. We don't have time for school foolishness. You know, he has too, too much work to do. So anyhow, he he was pretty much self educated. So he he got a homestead uh, up on the Elbow Bullock Track there, and then he. He bought, well, he first of all, he bought a, a camera, a big old, you know, five by seven or whatever, with the plates and all, like the photographers used, the glass plates. And he did a lot of the early photography around here. A lot of the old pictures you see are ones that he took. And then he bought books, uh, books on English, books on mathematics, books on stuff, and sort of educated himself and uh, taught himself how to do photography and develop pictures and such. And then, unfortunately, his, his uh, cabin up there, there was that, that whole country up there burned. And so uh, his cabin burned, but, uh, and, and, uh, and all his uh, glass plates and photography negatives were destroyed, unfortunately. So. The only ones that existed are the pictures that he gave away to people. But uh, anyhow. Uh, so he did a lot of surveying too, right? Well, he did, he did, did a lot of uh, timber cruising where you have to be, you have to be very uh, good with a compass and, uh, you know, to uh, so you're not on to figure out where you are in the, in the woods. And uh, he was very good. He was a very good compass man, and and uh, and, and then he, he was very good at, at pacing. So instead of measuring, you know, like the surveyors do, they have a chain and they measure out so far, and they he, he just he would just take it, run a compass line and pace. And uh, <clears throat> one example I could give you is he was <clears throat> he was looking. He was looking at uh, helping Phil Hedstrom look at some timber uh, somewhere uh, in the, on the trail here. And uh, there was two 40s, 80 acres. And they, so they went on the, with the compass, found the, what they, he felt was the corner of the 40. So they went a half a mile to the east and a, and a quarter of a mile you know, to the, to the north and back west, quarter of a mile back. And all pacing, no no measuring, just pacing. And when they got back, he said, well, I think we should be about where we started from. And Phil had noticed when they started, there was a big piece of birch bark laying there. And when they came back, there was a piece of birch bark. He'd, he'd walked a half a mile that way, quarter mile that way, half a mile that way, back a quarter of a mile, all pacing just with the compass, and came out to the spot where they started. Through the woods. Through the woods, yeah. 
<laughs> he was very good, very good in the cover, very accurate. Yeah. And he wrote, he drew, he had a book of the whole, is it the whole county? Yeah. Well, yeah, it's a plot book. A it's plot book one that, he, that uh, you know, that he made. Uh, like you, you can buy now, but he made, uh, he made one out of a map and, and then he colored it into, you know, because he worked for the state, you know, all the state, state lands, all the county lands, all the federal lands, all the private lands. It was all colored in before you could buy a regular plot book. This was just made from a map. And, uh, and the lakes were colored in. It was... Yeah. yeah. So this... The entire county. This yeah. is... Yeah. Uh, yeah. Is this a photocopy of it? Yeah. Our, yeah my nephew uh, uh, enlarged it and made a book see. out of it. And, and uh, he... Uh, That's one of them. Did, I think all of the kids... And of course, this is blown up. This was a very small, yeah, little small notebook, you know, in its size. And and he uh, always carried. He had a free uh, little case that he carried with him with the compass and that book in it. And so he always knew exactly where he was and what what he was looking for. Did he? Where's the original notebook? We have it. Yeah, it's here. Right, but we don't want everybody touching that. Well, if you can touch it. <laughs> no, no, the photocopies are just fine. So I showed some to give. If anybody watches this video, the they get an idea of what it looked like anyway. Yeah, because yeah, was oh, this one is Gunpoint Lake. Was uh, did my dad come over here to do? borrow some maps or something for I think so yeah, yeah. that'll be a whole nother interview yeah, I'll have yeah. to do with my dad on the yeah. there's the original oh wow it's been well used <laughs> that is well used yeah. he's carried that probably Hundreds of miles through the woods. <laughs> and it really is just tiny. I mean, yep. there's my hand next to it. And then he would write in there all the, not only, or he would write in there where the sections and the, and the township and the range and the 40, the exact 40 on each one, he would exit out. If you look at these, you can find the corresponding 40s. And then who bought the permit, Yeah, the state who, permit, who, the state who, permit number, and what kind of wood they harvested off of that permit yeah. on each one of these. It's all. He has there. the nicest, tiniest handwriting. Yeah, I'm sure it was done with a straight pen, you know, mm -hmm. with an old-fashioned straight pen. Wow. Stick pen. Yeah. No, that's that's pretty amazing. He was quite the artist. Yeah. Let's see here. And he wasn't a real big guy. No. But he he could take a seventeen foot canvas canoe out of the water yeah. in one swoop. Yeah. Out of a off of a dock. He could pull it up out of the water. And go. <laughs> I was struggling. Yeah. He would go right up there. I think he could do it to a 20. Oh, is that right? Yeah, because when he paddled alone, he always took a 20. Oh, but okay. The state had a lot of different canoes, but he took a 20 because they paddle easy. They sit right on top of the water. Yeah. So he'd always take a bit along. He didn't like short canoes because they paddle too hard. Oh, jeez. <laughs> go on top of the water. <laughs> so what would he, I mean, don't you have to put some sort of something over the canvas to well, keep it? Waterproof. They're painted. They're painted. Oh, okay. Yeah, it's It looks like it looks like a Winona now. You know, a canvas canoe. It's done nicely, but it. Uh, but the the old style, of course, was with the high prows, and I like the looks of that kind of a canoe to this day. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So up at Chickwalk, we. Yeah, we. Yeah. I, I I donated a. An old town canvas uh, canoe that I that well actually he found and, and in the woods and I took it home when I was young and fixed it up and used it for many years and until I finally got an aluminum canoe and then 
uh, we, when they were doing the boat, uh, the marine boathouse thing up at Chickwalk, and they were looking for old canoes. So I, I thought, well, I, I'm not going to need it, so I donated it to them. It's there for anybody to see. And when I was a teenager and in love, <laughs> <laughs> his Wayne's dad made a, a blank paddle for me out of um, cedar, and I carved it, and, you know, got it all shaped up and whatnot and varnished it and right, sandpapered and varnished and and I had that and so that's up there yeah, at the with, with, with the, the canoe. canoe. Yeah. Oh very yeah. cool. So that's in the canoe at the museum. So we've we've had Wayne do quite a bit of, of talking. Certainly have. <laughs> and he was worried he wouldn't have anything to say. <laughs> uh, but going back to your parents and to put everybody on, you know, the spot again. Uh, do you have, Rolf Anderson, do you have a favorite memory of your grandparents? Um, well, there, there's many, uh, all the memories of my grandparents are very fond, are very, uh, very sentimental. Um, the, it was a kind of a refuge for us, I think, from myself and my brothers. Um, you know, they lived a half mile from us growing up, and it was commonly you'd stay, you'd spend the night, especially on a weekend, you know, on a Friday or Saturday night, you always would go and, or you'd go and have lunch. You'd have lunch with them very commonly. And it was, you know, so, I, small. I I don't have any one particular memory. I'm I'm a rambler, I guess. But I I think about small things, just like with eating with my grandparents, eating lunch, and it was a there was a routine to it. There was there was and and it was all homemade soups or homemade, homemade rye bread. And I, I think about like we were young kids, and I think I see kids that won't eat bread crust. Well. My grandma, I think, taught us to uh, cherish the bread crust of a rye bread because you, I just remember this, babe, we would take the homemade rye bread crust off the bread. You know, you'd have peanut butter and you'd eat it with your tea. After. No, you'd, you'd eat your peanut butter. And then after you'd have tea and uh, you'd, you'd dip the rye crust in the tea. That was like a real delicacy at the end. So, I mean, a bread crust was something to be savored. And I'm sure that was, she'd raised so many generations of kids that, you know, she knew how to. Um, but uh, there's lots of many, any, anything there, there were the music parties there. We'd, there'd be uh, events. A lot of people would come and, and there'd be uh, coffee parties and uh, music was played accordion music. Like grandmother would accompany on the piano. And um, Christmas, Christmas Eve, so, you know, that kind of thing. I think you pretty well nailed that. It's something that you all certainly still carry on, you know, as the generations go on that. I mean, it's the thing I picked up on is the, the hospitality and um, those traditions, the food, the things that go around food. Obviously, I'm kind of a fan of food. Yeah. Uh, you know, the hard tack. A, a lot of things centered around food in our family. And you yeah. can tell a lot by looking at me. <laughs> <laughs> and the fisk at Christmas. Yeah. Yes. That was always the tradition, and it still is. And um, I've tried to keep the tradition of Christmas Eve the way Wayne's mother uh, did it because I, for my kids, you know, and grandkids want them to know what the tradition was. And so we, we have good fisk on Christmas Eve and we make, I make a, a ham loaf because grandma made that. And then with a raisin sauce for that, for those who don't want the loot fisk. And, um, and then we always eat it with swilling down root beer. <laughs> because that's the Hedstrom tradition. <laughs> and um, so we do that and, and 
uh, diced rutabagas cooked and um, mashed potatoes and the white sauce with a little bit of all spice in it and um, melted butter. And uh, so I just want to keep that alive for the kids. Mom, you, you, you have done her. That's something that's, you have, uh, you, I mean, you're, you're in your own right. You're a phenomenal cook. Mm -hmm. And, and, but, uh, but it's, it's, I, I think it's sort of unspoken, but you, you, some, some of your expertise has, was gleaned from, uh, my yeah. grandma, from yeah. my grandma Mildred. Oh yeah. And, uh, I guess there's one thing that I, a story that, uh, I heard, Eddie Johnson from uh, Johnson's, Johnson's grocery store. Grocery yeah. store. Yeah. He he always chuckled about. He he was telling me one time that uh, my grandmother Mildred would uh, she would win the grand the best affair for the for the homemade rye bread uh, and year after year. And then uh, Teddy told a story that she taught you how to bake rye bread or. Or told you, showed you how to do it, and then you won best affair. You beat her in <laughs> yeah, best affair. Yeah. <laughs> he got it. He always he chuckled yeah. at yeah. that story. Yeah, yeah. The first year I was married, um, I baked white bread because they always, in those days, they had at the fair a uh, sort of a grand prize for the best white bread. So the first summer, I mean, I was married in July, and the fair was in August, and I baked some bread, and I won the. <laughs> I won the prize, <laughs> but I do have to give my mother a little bit of credit because she was a cook too. And, and um, very good cook. yeah, and so she we had with this when I was growing up too. But uh, but yeah, Wayne's mother, I learned a lot from her. Yeah, I have told my son that if you ever get a chance to eat at Wayne and Phyllis's, you do it. <laughs> <laughs> I, I better have him over then. <laughs> When it comes to clean the chicken poop. <laughs> yeah. So yeah. you had, I mean, you are, um, Wayne's parents were your in-laws. Mm -hmm. And so it gives you maybe a different perspective. But what are, you know, do you have a favorite story or favorite memories <laughs> of them? Some of them I probably shouldn't even <laughs> appropriate for prime time okay, YouTube. Okay. <clears throat> um, um, I'm just trying to think, um, you know, there were just so many aspects of, of fun times. I guess, you know, what I remember when they were both alive is that Sunday afternoons and evenings, we would save for our family night and we would go, we'd pack up a picnic and Wayne's mother, you know, would certainly do it. And I would probably add to it. And, and um, I remember her baked beans were pretty good, but we would uh, pack up a picnic and go to a campground or somewhere and have a picnic supper. And even when the kids were little and even when babies were tiny, I, you know, I don't know which one, but I remember babies were sitting on the picnic table at campgrounds and and we made it a Sunday tradition and Wayne's mom and dad would go and it was just one something we always look forward to on weekends you know on Sundays and we still do it to this day we have a cabin on West Bearskin and, and usually Sunday nights we go up there and have picnic and fun and swim and, and uh, we even go in the winter time and and hike across the lake to get there. So. And you're just a little bit musical. Uh, <laughs> so were you part of the the playing when they would have music parties? Did you play with Mildred at all? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But, you know, as, as the kids got into music and whatnot, um, you know, she would incorporate them into her songs and whatnot. And she and Kent because Kent played the violin, um, they would they would play when he was a little. She yeah. played the piano. She played the piano. Yeah. And she had perfect pitch, which means that I could be in one room or I could be where the piano was and she could be in the kitchen and I'd play a note. She could tell me what that note was. And that's perfect pitch, which is, is not everybody has it. And um, I have relative perfect. Um, 
just because of the oboe and the, the um, overtones of the oboe. You know, I, I know what notes, mm -hmm. but, um, but yeah. And she was, she was not trained, you know, she just played the piano, but she had perfect pitch. <laughs> yeah. Wow. Yeah. 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 So, you know, indeed, I think that our musical, the kids' musical talents come from both sides. Um, my mother was a professional violinist, but, but Grandma Mildred played the piano, and my mother had perfect pitch, and uh, Mildred had perfect pitch. Wow, doubly yeah. blessed. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. And I always say, they all take after me. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I can't play anything for it. Uh, the radio. Yeah. 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 And all, all our kids played an instrument, you know. Mm -hmm. And Rolf still plucks away on the guitar, and Ken still fiddles on the violin, and Matt still plays the piano. And Mark, no, he did his trombone burned up, I think, in his house there. The trombone but, burned. Yeah, but all the kids have played. So, and music is good. It's good for the brain. <laughs> yeah, for sure. Yeah. yeah. When my grandma married my grandpa, she said it was the day the music died. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> she came from a very musical family, and his was not. So. Oh, no. Yeah. Well, Wayne has spent many, many sleepless nights listening to me practice when I played in the symphony orchestras. Yeah. I mean, I'd practice at midnight, and I had to. Right. Because I had to learn the music, and I was busy during the day taking care of kids. Yeah. Or else driving to Duluth to get there or Thunder Bay. But yeah. So there was sacrifice for him. He had to take care of the kids while I was gone. I survived. Yeah. No problem. But, yeah. Yeah. And the kids survived. I mean, the kids <laughs> sacrificed. Can I just tell you a funny story? About yeah. I, would, I would take one of the boys up to rehearsal in Thunder Bay, you know, when they were little. And uh, so Matthew's, it was Matthew's turn one night and it was in the winter time and we're driving back from Thunder Bay and we got to um, uh, Mount what is Josephine, Josephine uh, in, in Grand Portage. And I was getting so tired and it was winter cold out. And um, so I pulled over in, in the little parking area and I said to Matt, I just have to sleep for a minute. And, um, and I just thought that would, you know, then I could go again. And so, Here's this little kid in the car, and I fell asleep. And all of a sudden, about a half hour later, can we go yet? <laughs> <laughs> you know, he was cold because I turned the car off. <laughs> and, oh, my gosh. I probably would have slept there all night had he not been there. <laughs> yeah, we can go. <laughs> oh, dear. Yeah. All right. Kent, what, what is a favorite memory or two or, of your grandparents? Um, well, my, my grandpa passed away when I was pretty young. I mean, I was about seven, although I remember him vividly. And, but um, I remember, so he, in his final, the last few years um, of his life, he, he had issues with a leg. He ended up having to get it amputated. So he was in a wheelchair for most of the time that I remember him. But one of my earliest memories of him is, and he was probably, you know, about 90 at the time. So he wasn't moving real quickly, but he and I were uh, danced while my grandma played and I'm not going to imitate the dancing, but it was <laughs> pretty basic. But it, anyway, I, I always remember that because <laughs> I suppose I was, quite high strung i remember <laughs> even the poor guy when he was in his wheelchair you know i used to crawl all over him like a monkey and he put up with it he never <laughs> got mad at me he never said nothing he'd put up and i'm sure i <laughs> oh boy but and i remember you know i'm sure i can only imagine you know in his older years when he was after being mobile his whole life and being able to to do everything and then being succumbed to a wheelchair um 
and he couldn't do much. And then he started to go blind at the very end, you know, and, and uh, but I do, but my grandma would try to keep him doing stuff. She would, I remember she would wheel him out or help wheel him out into the woodshed. And then we had a saw buck out there and we had a, our dad had a sawmill. And so he always had slabs and, and there was a saw buck out there and, and we, and my grandparents had a, an electric chainsaw. And my grandma would set a big wool blanket over his lap and she would load the saw buck and he would buck the wood and she would throw it for him. And I saw this would fill up on him, you know, but, <laughs> but you know, I mean, it, it made him feel, I mean, it, it, he was able to do something, you know, but I remember being, uh, being around for that. And of course, like Rolf was saying, you know, getting to, um, getting to go over there and spend the night that was always fun. And they, my brother's being quite a bit older than I, and then we have a cousin who was more like a sister than a cousin. And, uh, and we, she came to and stayed here just about every summer growing up as well. And so the, the four of them basically were always together. And I did too, you know, later on, but I was always quite a bit younger. And, uh, but that was always a, that was fun. And I also, another memory I remember, and I assume it was the 4th of July and my brothers remember this much better, I'm sure. But I remember standing in the driveway watching grandpa uh, light M80 fire, those big firecrackers off with a can. And the can, I mean, the can went forever. <laughs> Shoot a soup can in the air. Yeah, yeah. I, I do remember. Soup can fly and I remember it was loud and I was scared of that. So I stood way back, you know, with grandma, but I remember him setting those off and that I was must have been pretty young because he was still walking then so <laughs> do, do you remember like when when you'd stay there I, I assume like Matt and I or probably you and I but uh, one of the novelties of staying there you know like over into a Saturday morning you know you'd be awake of course you just wide awake waiting <laughs> waiting <laughs> waiting waiting <laughs> and then you'd finally hear the sound of his slippers <laughs> as they as they shuffled down the hall and he was going to the kitchen to make fire in the, in the cook stove, yeah. you know, to start coffee or, or whatever, yeah. or, or bring, bring, take the edge off in the yep. kitchen. And that, and then we would of course sneak, you know, after he patiently went by, we'd sneak behind him as if he, he knew we were there, of course. <laughs> and, but we, then we would hide kind of just behind the cook stove. And when he'd come back from firing the stove, you know, right. It's always the same spot. <laughs> you jump out and whoo, and then he'd have to, oh, who? Oh, he'd, he'd act, act like he act was surprised, yeah. you know, every, every time. And he always did, you know. Yeah, yeah. And it was just a routine. You had, it had to be done. Yeah. It was not. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And that cook stove was kind of a center point to that kitchen. So, especially in later years, but the cook stove went every day, 365 days a year. And and so you, you know, it would be a hot summer day, but you'd go into that kitchen and it was hotter. <laughs> <laughs> and there's always, and, and of course, when grandma was older, this was long after grandpa had passed, but when she was older, as elderly people, uh, you know, they can't, it's, they are colder. So, you know, if even on a hot day, if the screen door or something would be open, she had a fire, eh, shut the screen door. Can you bring some wood? Because. It's a little chilly, huh? okay, <laughs> 75 out, but I guess but I ain't going to argue with her. But but that cook stove, she would cook on it every day. She There were certain things about the cook stove that she liked better than the electric range. So she would cook, she would fry just about anything she fried she did on the cook stove. She would bake potatoes. She would, uh, I don't remember baking bread. But you were saying yeah. that you remembered her, oh, yeah. well, obviously, when there was no electric range before yeah. that, and carrying, if the stove got too hot, and carrying wood out and throwing it in the snowbank. <laughs> <laughs> no, I remember her baking bread. In the yeah. Cookbook, so, and yeah. I always had wonderful crust. Yeah. Uh, her electric range was not a normal <clears throat> width. It was the narrow yeah. uh, apartment, apartment size, yeah. size apartment. range. Yeah. And it would, if, sometimes it would break down, yeah. and it would be down for two weeks. Oh, yeah. Wouldn't it? And she didn't care. No, she's like, oh, that's oh yeah. The range has been hasn't worked for a month or yeah. two, but I just cook. I yeah. make everything on the cook stove. She yeah. makes soup on her on her cook yeah. stove. So, so cook stove. go ahead. 
the cook stove came on the mm -hmm. ship America from Duluth, and they what hauled yeah. it up to the house what with horses? Yeah, but it came from Chicago on by rail yeah. before that. Yeah. yeah, yeah, but it it came from Duluth. and it hasn't moved since, right? No, <laughs> <laughs> it moved once when we redid the floor, but we moved oh. it back. <laughs> It's heavy. What year yeah. would that have been that it came on the on the steamer America? 1919 or 20? Something like that, yeah. Because I think my dad had it before he was married. Yeah. You know, can anybody tell, since we're talking about our, like Kent and I are talking about our uh, memories of my grandfather, but can anybody tell, and Dad, you probably can the best, I don't mean to put you on the spot, but like my grandpa, when he was a young boy, uh, Riding on the steamship Dixon in the VIP. Oh yeah, uh, is oh, yeah. that something? I, I can tell that briefly. And again, I, 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 I think it's historical society has it, but but when his first trip to Grand Marais when he was ten years old it was in the fall, and he came on the Dixon, the, the predecessor of the America, and uh, it was time for supper. And so the steward called the supper hour, and everybody went to the table. And he, being a 10 year old and had been taught not to be too forward, he hung back a little bit, and the table filled up, and he didn't have a place. So he thought he's going to miss out, but the steward came and put his hand on his shoulder and said, Come out to the galley with me, we'll, we'll find a place for you. So he did, and he seated him at the uh, right at the near the end of the table, right here. And there was a big man sitting at the head at the end of the table, and uh, the, the steward was very attentive to him and respectful. And uh, anyhow, it, it turned out that the, that man was. Colonel Colville, the, the, who Civil. commanded the 1st Minnesota Regiment at Gettysburg. Civil War. Mm. In the Civil War, and he, and he came, he had a place out by just east of town, and uh, he was coming up to his thing. So, so he actually got to meet, well, I don't know, to see at least, and Sit by and eat with Colonel Caldwell. And tell him about the, tell her about the uh, medicine. That he could well, and the, yeah, the, the, the steward is very attentive and, and uh, asked him, you know, can I get you anything else, Colonel? And no, no, I'm fine. He said, just bring me a glass of water. So he brought him a glass of water and he reached in his vest pocket and he got a little envelope of a powder put in the glass and stirred it. Of course, my dad was a 10-year-old, so he was watching this. Was some <coughs> medication, you know, they didn't have pills that they had powdered. And he put it in there and then he drank it. And, well, it was a big deal. This little kid was watching. <laughs> <laughs> Colonel Caldwell was a huge man, six foot five or six. Wow. And uh, a very impressive man. So you know, no wonder a 10-year-old would, would <laughs> notice. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, it, it was a lot. Grandpa told me the story as a young kid, and of course, as a young kid, you're like, uh, you know, you try, you don't have the appreciation for it that you do now. I, but I just remember the part I really that stuck with me was, you know, this is a his his very bushy eyebrows. Yeah, he had bushy, bushy eyebrows. eyebrows. He's <laughs> in the courtroom in the uh, courthouse in Grand Marie. There's a picture of him. Yeah, <laughs> well, I think it's about time for either bed or dessert, one or the other. <laughs> well, probably dessert first and then bed. Okay. Yeah. So, uh, thank you for watching this, and uh, we'll be back with Wayne again. Um, and Wayne and family, uh, thank you all for doing this this evening. Thank you, Maria. Yeah, thank, yeah, thank you, you. Yeah. for asking us.